and you wouldn't find dates anymore. So why don't we just get you something even better?
disclosures were very strict about no pharmaceutical companies or anyone else ever submitting any literature or being on our premises. Um, and I'll, I try to throw in a few jokes. <laughs> I always start all of my talks with, with quizzes for people to get some information and, and see how we're doing. So question number one, and again, my talk is, this talk and most of the stuff we do is geared a little more towards 26 and under, but we work with adults all the time as well. And, um, so here's a good question. Half of all mental illness begins before age, how many say A, 8, B, 14, C, 18, D, 21? Good. We have a pretty smart crowd. Lots of hands went up for 14. Three fourths of all mental illness begins before age. How many A for 18? B, 21. C, 24. D, 28. I think Vic has done well at all the talks. All that reading is talking to you. 24 is correct. So our average delay before treatment from when mental health symptoms first appear, A, 1 to 3, B, 4 to 6, C, 6 to 8, or D, 8 to 10? D, 8 to 10. is correct. So this is one of those, when you're go looking for the extreme shock value, pick that choice answer. <laughs> but yeah, so if, most, if half of all illness begins, mental illness begins before age 14, and it's 10 years to get treatment, you can imagine m how much more difficult it is yeah. to um, treat the, the illness. Um, according to data from the CDC in 2012, suicide was the blank leading cause of death in the U.S. So A is fifth, B is tenth, C is fifteenth, D is twentieth. Vic, continue three for three. <laughs> so tenth is correct. This is for all. This is for all ages. Now data for CDC for age five to twenty-four, suicide of what? what leading cause of death in the U.S. So A is second, B is fourth, C is sixth, D is tenth, second is correct. Does anyone know what number one is for this age group? I think accidents in general, so, which sort of covers a lot of categories, but, and did someone say guns? So number three is homicide, which those of us in the field know that is often a mental health tied mortality as well. Um, <laughs> this, this, the, this talk that we downloaded off the internet, there's a couple of um, slides that aren't completely cleaned up, so I apologize for that in advance, because I made a couple of final modifications. Um, very briefly about me, I was actually born in San Jose and grew up less than a mile from here in this uh -huh. zip code. Um, I went to Lee High School down the street. All right. And then <laughs> we have other <laughs> Go Longhorns. <laughs> and uh, I went to um, Berkeley for undergrad. Uh, I spent some time in Oakland working for Kaiser Division of Research. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan for a master's degree in public health. I went to medical school in Detroit at Wayne State University. Then I went out to Arizona where I did training in adult psychiatry at a community mental health program, um, working in, uh, with a lot of underserved populations. And then I came out to Stanford for a three-year um, fellowship in research in child psychiatry. Um, and even though I adjunct faculty at Stanford, I maintained my alliance to the bear, to Cal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a computer programmer, so I, my father was an engineer and I grew up as a computer programmer and I worked a few years as a statistical consultant. And the reason I list that is because as a computer programmer, you everything can be solved. Every problem, there's solutions and multiple solutions. And you know, unfortunately, I got interested in mental health. So, but the good piece is there's really, this is really a big challenge for someone who's used to engaging in an issue and let's solve the problems that we face. Um, as an epidemiologist and public health person, I always try to take a global public health perspective on what's happening and how can we make things better. 
and not just from an individual level, but from a whole societal level. Um, and then, you know, I, I was very interested in pediatrics. I'm not going to be here this weekend because I'm moving my older son to UC Santa Barbara where he's starting school. And my two older kids were born during my medical training. So I was very interested in pediatrics. And a good mentor pushed me towards child psychiatry, saying that's where we really need to um, put some efforts towards changing the system. So that, that's how I wound up in this area. <laughs> when I was at Stanford, so I was on this government research fellowship, which is sort of an academic career path. But similar to political systems, Stanford's a big bureaucracy. The clinicians who are there who are excellent, unfortunately, are really not the decision makers. So if you want to change something about the current care model, choosing an academic career, good luck if in 20 years you can change anything. And I realized that sort of quickly. So while I was at Stanford, I started the nonprofit agency, <laughs> Barry Children's Association knowing that I probably didn't have the tolerance for the academic um, situation that I wanted to make change right away that didn't have to go through 20 committees and a big bureaucracy. And that's how my clinics were formed. So I want to talk a little bit about our current care model. And here's some of the formatting problems I apologize for if this isn't the final standard version. But I just want to point out globally. So here's, here's our mortality. Here's the suicide potential leading cause. And here's all our other cause, leading causes of death. Um, and the most important thing here is that you can see for the top two causes of death, the trend since 2007 is that deaths from heart disease are going down and deaths from cancer are going down, but the deaths from suicide are going up. And so the key finding of the reports for the causes of death is that the leading causes of death remain the same, but for eight of the 10 leading causes, all, they're all going down, but for one of the 10 causes, which is suicide, it's gone up significantly. Uh, and this is not okay. And then I also like to uh, put in, here's our average life expectancy based on the latest table, so this is for the year right now. But that's what's important for this talk. But, and, and a lot of people who are here know about the broken system, I think, and know about the problem, and that's why NAMI exists, and that's what some of the things that we're fighting for. I'll try to avoid too much preaching to the choir. Bringing it to a more local level about what we've experienced in the areas. So here in Alameda, San Mateo, Santa Clara County, deaths for ages five to 24, we can see 85 kids have died from suicide. I put the homicide number here again because that is usually related to mental health. But you can see there's been more deaths from suicide than cancer in this age group. And that I don't like to pick on cancer kids and no one should, but when you're a child psychiatrist and we're fighting to stop suicide, you know, one equals one, a life equals a life, and we need to look carefully at where our resources, are we getting equal resources for saving lives from the, any cause? Just a couple of words on morbidity, which again, we know this, that depression, and, and some people will argue depression is the number one cause of morbidity and suffering in the whole world as a global issue, but most people agree that it's at least the second leading cause of morbidity um, in all nations such as the United States, leading to billions of dollars lost, lost productivity, problems with income, uh, and that depression plays a role in 70% of suicides. So talk a little bit about our current care model and problems with it. So, how do we screen, and there's a discussion about prevention as well, and really what we need to do is look towards the full continuum of care for all illnesses, and that includes all mental health issues. So if we're going to address our broken system, we need to first start with looking at our screening and identification of issues. And this is why I talked to Vic about this bill that's on the governor's desk, that I think it will be, hopefully he signs it, and anything that brings increased awareness is, is good. The controversy or some of the problems is that if we get really good screening in place, we need to have the resources for people to get the proper help that they need. And 
right now we're in a bit of a crisis situation in getting help for kids or adults or anyone with mental health issues. So whereas schools are the logical place for kids and youth to do the screening and identification, and especially college campuses as well, there's a, an ethical issue between if you identify the one in three adults or one in four kids that need some sort of mental health treatment, and you say, you need help, Here's some numbers to call, and then if people are engaged and try to call the numbers and can't get in for any help, you create a sense of hopelessness in people that you've maybe stepped forward and talked about your mental health issues. Here's some numbers to call. If you, no one can see you, arguably that can make you feel more hopeless than if you had just not even been aware. So this is something that our clinic and other clinics were trying to strategize around how do we solve this issue. Um, there's there's studies on emergency departments as screening areas and how emergency departments in general are awful experiences if you go in with any sort of mental health issue. That instead of going in and getting help you need, you often wind up chained to a gurney in a hallway and spend many hours waiting there. And it's, if that's your first encounter with the mental health system or getting help, you're not going to really want to go back. And then we have lots of problems with wait times to get in for services. Um, we did a study where we take volunteers who come volunteer at our agency and we ask them to pretend they're the parent of a 13 year old, take their insurance card and see how long, see if you can get an appointment to get in to be seen. And then the 55 people on the signal list within five miles of here, 52 of them aren't accepting patients. Two of them are, but it's a four to six month wait. And quite honestly, some of the people who have openings are the people you wouldn't send your pet to for you know, these care issues. And it's this, this situation that's happened in the area where a lot of our best and brightest don't bother, don't wanna take insurance because it's a hassle to deal with insurances or counties. And so they wind up doing these cash practices and the people who wind up then taking insurance are, are not necessarily doing it for altruistic reasons. This is, isn't universally true, but it's a, it is a problem in, in this community specifically. You know, interestingly, and I won't talk too much about our dealings with the different counties and just our nonprofit becoming a Medi-Cal provider, and we were for a while in Santa Clara County, but the county has, you know, they would sort of allow this, you're, your psychiatrist can write prescriptions, but they won't let my therapist or my multidisciplinary team do therapy and work with the family. And so it was sort of anti our care model. And um, so we have just used a generous sliding scale and financial aid policy to get people, the Medi-Cal population in. But what's happened is very interestingly in mental health, it's the people who have insurance with Cigna or Anthem or some sort of commercial insurance that actually have the hardest time getting connected with services. So if you have Medi-Cal services, there are services that you can get and you have cash, you can go pay for people to treat you. But if you're trying to use your insurance card, those are the people that have the hardest time getting access right now. Uh, just more, so on our fragmentation of the mental health care system, this is from David Satcher, the then Surgeon General in 1999, who did a nice job this was the initial awareness and announcement of the crisis. Now we're almost 20 years later and not much has changed, but I, lo I love this sentence, which is, you know, it's often navigating a bewildering, bewildering maze to get treatment. And in California, you know, things aren't complicated enough. California has to disperse its state dollars to each of the 58 counties. So take something already complex, give it to all the counties to decide how they want to implement it. And so we, we don't, every county just has different rules that meet those specific political, financial, other agendas that are going on from county to county. And that makes it very difficult. Um, we're, we work with some people in Minnesota who have a much easier time because if the state controls the Medicaid dollars, they can present to one group of people and get um, proper funding and be able to provide services. We've meet, been meeting with Santa Clara County and Alameda County for a long time. They're hugely different counties, and it, 
it's so much resources to just try to meet with the right people. And all we want to do is provide services, and it's been a real struggle. Um, I like the way uh, you say the country, different country in the city in California. But since this has been going on for so long now, it seems like we don't really see the hope to resolve this issue in a very you know, near future. Is there any solution? Because California is so uh, rich in the country, budget rich, and the uh, Santa Clara is one of the wealthy country, you know, part. But the uh, mental health, very, very well in the county level. Lack of oversight and lack of the, a lot of bureaucracy. And uh, it's hard to crack, you know? So I feel uh, kind of disappointed sometimes. Yeah, no, and I'm, I, I like to end on the hopeful and positive notes. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is hope and stuff I've learned over the last 10 years has helped shape like the newer strategy that we're taking. Um, to try to engage with the counties and then work towards the state level, which is a complex process. But I do, I do believe there is hope, and we'll, I'll talk towards the end about how I hope that we can make change and, and make things better in California. Um, but another thing, I don't know if you like for me to uh, raise the no, question. Please, because please. I was want to raise that question earlier. Uh, a few slides ago, you mentioned about something about homicide is number three. Death. And then you also mentioned about uh, sometimes homicide is mental um, health issue related. I think we have to be um, a little bit more cognitive in using the homicide related to mental health, that mental illness, because there's a mass of media project. Mm -hmm. You know, people have mental illness, they are kind of psychopath, or they are the serial killer, or right. even the, you know, the violence. The stigma for the society nowadays is still very, very heavy. I remember when the media would project this kind of story on the TV, my son was disappointed, and then he cannot watch the TV. He had to walk away. So I think. Um, yeah, you're um, right, and, and I should be a bit more clear, and, but I think homicide the other direction. So that, right, right. Yeah, not, not that people. Right, right, and exactly. Those of us who work in mental health and mental illness know that it, it's the reverse direction that right, people but would. Yeah. Most people don't understand. You're you know? right, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thank you. Sure. No, good comment. Nick. Yeah, just a couple of things since I got brought up again. So in Santa Clara County, we have three times as many um, suicides as homicides. In the state of California, it's three suicides for every two homicides. In a survey done in 2011, it noted that when people realized that there are more suicides than homicides, it, there were gaps. There's a bill on the governor's desk, it's AB 2017. And what it does is it, it takes some of the Mental Health Services Act money and puts it into a grant-based program for colleges to provide a matching fund so that college campuses have mental health. There, that bill was really proposed by former Senator Steinberg, who wrote the Mental Health Services Act. And why he did that is that we were funding different programs across counties, money, their money pool under Cal Mesa, but most of the counties aren't giving that money now, even though Mental Health Services Act funding keeps going up. So there's a bill people could write to the governor about AB 2017. with mental health treatments and in this area and nationwide is we have terrible systems fragmentation. So like a good Sam hospital here, if you have cardiovascular disease, you can come here and see someone for your outpatient care. You could come here and get a treadmill test. You could come here and see a dietitian about what to eat. If you have the heart, a heart attack and you need critical care, you can come here and you can get all your care in one place. 
this does not exist for mental health in the Bay Area. We don't have any facility that provides all the way from prevention to outpatient care to intensive services, so IOP, which is like three hours a day, three to five days a week, partial programs, five, six hours a day, five days a week, and then rarely, you know, there are times that you need some inpatient hospitalization, but right now there's too much, it's to inpatient because people can't access these other levels of care. And there's not a single care system within 400 miles of here. There's a couple in Los Angeles that you can get all the care from prevention all the way to inpatient if you need it. So we're gonna, we'll talk about this a little bit, but you know, the best treatment for mental health from an evidence-based perspective is this biopsychosocial treatment. So it means you need to address the biological piece um, you need to address the psychological treatment, which is the different appropriate evidence-based therapy treatments, and then you need to address social issues, such as dealing with the school system for kids, employment for adults, social services, and the gold standard care is to be in a place that addresses all of these issues. Um, yeah, and so we, we have a serious problem with not having this in, these piece in place here. Talk a little bit more about what is the best care. <laughs> so from a, from a child, go ahead. Yeah. Is there any reason why mental illness is not treated like all other illnesses? And it's both both in terms of resources and attitudes. And I think it'll, it may always be that way, but hopefully not. Yeah, I mean, this. This is a, another three hour talk, but um, <laughs> the, the one piece, so there's, a, there's many different theories. It could come, the, the simplest answer is it may never be the same because mental health money, it doesn't pay like other, other medical illnesses or other illnesses in general. There's not the same money in treating mental health as there is in treating heart attacks or treating cancer. And, and since the cynical view is everything revolves around money, so maybe we'll never get there. The, the other piece is that the systems that were built in the 50s and 60s, like Kaiser, which does, you know, does a good job for medical care, but they're awful for mental health. And part of it was maybe the stigma, which is getting less, but the stigma from 40 and 50 years ago you know, they didn't, they didn't build the resources to provide mental health treatment for one in four of their members. And um, now that the stigma has gotten less, and it, the really promising pieces, and this is part of my hopefulness, is among our youth, we were almost, stigma is almost gone. And so people are out there with mental health issues and wanting help and wanting treatment, but now can, you know, can the rest of the treatment systems catch up and are people motivated to catch up? And I feel like I can say this in this audience, people maybe know Stanford is spending over a billion dollars on this new children's hospital. Sort of aggravates me every time I drive by their sign saying, number one hospital in Northern California. And then my mind just goes, you don't treat the number two cause of death. How are you the number one children's hospital? And it's because there's no money, that, there's no money there. And so, you know, I'll keep my other questions. You know, these are the things that drive me crazy. And I, I'm faculty at Stanford. That's a whole other talk for a couple hours. <laughs> I, I mainly try to teach our young doctors and try to instill like, we need to make changes in the system and fight the system. I know better now than to try to go um, stay to sit in at the board for the Packard Hospital to say we demand mental health services. So, but yeah, it's it's a complex issue. I, I'm optimistic that the stigma piece is getting much better, and that's a great place to keep pushing our efforts. And then hopefully we have some solutions for the other pieces. So, uh, so for kids, you know, we need to have all. Sometimes for some of our families, we have a child with therapy treatments. We're, we're not a medication heavy agency, but when medications are appropriate for kids, we'll talk about them and use them and we need to have that available. Because what happens right now is, you know, 
right now someone might go see a psychiatrist and they're also getting therapy from two other people and the people don't communicate. And then it creates this phenomena of over-prescribing medications and not talking. And so we need to offer family treatment. We need to help the parents who are coming in. Because just logically, if you're treating a 10-year-old who's anxious, but they're anxious because their mom is severely depressed and hasn't been able to get treatment, no matter what you do with that child, they're not going to get better until you help everyone in the family. Um, you need to address things going on at the school, and you need to work with their primary care physician as well. So this is our gold standard best care model, uh, and we just don't have those agencies in place. <laughs> So how, you know, how do we allocate our, our resources? Uh, and this is, this is here, we're getting to a little bit of part of the solution. And so with the focus on child mental health, there's a nationwide shortage, a drastic shortage of child psychiatrists. We only have 8,000 practicing child psychiatrists and we need over 30,000. Doing a little, we'll do a little math exercise so in a, per, in a theoretical perfect world, one child psychiatrist, all the child psychiatrists in Palo Alto. It's 8,000 in the whole nation? That's, that's in the whole nation. The next slide, we, uh, we talked about how many we have in California. California is actually in better shape than a lot of states with respect to how many child psychiatrists are here. But um, So the child psychiatrists that go in solo practice up in Palo Alto or anywhere else, theoretically, if they got people in and did a 20 week course of therapy, which is sort of what we measure outcomes as, they could, and if they see 30 patients um, a week, they could theoretically treat 60 patients a year. So 30 patients a week doing six month treatments. That's, that's not gonna cut it if everyone is just seeing, treating 60 patients a year. So in our four largest Bay Area counties, we have about seven, three quarters of a million youth between the ages of five and 17. So if we're doing a conservative one in four youth at some point could use need mental health treatment, we would need 3,000 child psychiatrists in the Bay Area alone, just in these four counties to treat all these kids. We have about 1,000 child psychiatrists in California, which is actually pretty good compared to the rest of the US. And here's the US map. Places with blue, this blue purple color, there's no zero or one child psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. so you can see there's entire states there. Uh, I think Iowa has like one child psychiatrist. So there's entire states that are uh, drastically low. You can see California, we've got some other colors in here. So comparatively, we're doing better than a lot of places. A lot of people up here in the New York area as well. But this is just highlighting our drastic shortage of child psychiatry. What year is that? Since 2012. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, um, is there a reason why there's more in the same area that there's centers? Uh, I don't think there's centers, but what, what appeals to people about these areas or these areas? <laughs> the coast. Yeah, the, you know, California, the weather, the, they're in general popular places to live, and they're also places where wealth is higher as well. But, but one thing that doesn't take account the population of the community. That's that, that is one in eight child psychiatrists is in California, one in eight Americans is in California. That's, that's a good point. And this, this, that, yeah, if you look at it, it, it wouldn't be as, if we did a population-based chart, it wouldn't be as drastic. And I think part of the people who made this slide was for the shock value of, you know, there's no child psychiatrist in the entire state. You know, even though the state's population, you know, is, is drastically worse. So it, it's a very good point. Yeah. Correct, yeah. And it's, it's overall, we're just trying to highlight the shortage. And the, the federal levels try to do a few things to encourage people to go into child psychiatry. They passed a law that if you work for a nonprofit and pay your student loans for 10 years, they'll pay off your other 10 years. But um, like the people at my student loans weren't the, the right carrier, so don't mind for that. But <laughs> they'll be paid off when I'm 70. Uh, but so our solutions are problem solving, and I don't, you know, this 
child psychiatrists shouldn't be working alone. The mental health community shouldn't be alone. We need to, there's only 1,000 child psychiatrists, but we have 18,000 PhD level psychologists in the state of California. And we have 64,000 therapists and social workers licensed in the state of California. And this isn't counting the other 10 or 20,000 students at any given time or interns or nurse practitioner students or other people who are interested in mental health. So if we add these up and take these 83,000 people who could all treat 60 kids a year, that would be 5 million kids we could treat. So if our need is only 2.3 million kids, there is a solution, but it involves bringing everyone working together as, as teams. That is the solution. Uh, and I talk about this because this is what we do at our clinics, is develop these teams. Um, talk a little bit more about some barriers to care. So I mentioned a little bit of this already regarding Stanford or county systems or any government system. Pretty much any large system, it's difficult to institute change difficult to go in and institute change. Um, for example, when I was at Stanford doing our training, when you're working with kids, we know that you need to get both parents involved in the treatment, whether they're married, divorced, whatever the status is, the more family you can bring in, and this is true for adults too, the better your outcomes are going to be. But at the Stanford clinic, when we tried to suggest, hey, can we push a little harder to have both parents come in, that they wouldn't make this change to require both parents to come in when they bring the child in for an appointment. And so something that's logical and that leads to better outcomes, we couldn't get implemented at Stanford. So at, at our clinics, we 100% require both parents to show up for the intake and participate in treatment. Now, of course, there's exceptions, like if there's restraining orders or other pathologies and things like that. But if, but if there's joint custody and both parents are in the kid's life, we need to work with the entire family. And for better or for worse, there's such high demand that we can be a little aggressive about requiring that. But the goal is that that's how we get the best results. So people understand that when we explain it. Um, poverty. Um, so even, and I made the comment that if you have Medi-Cal, there actually may be some more services that you can get, but we have to be clear that socioeconomic status and trauma and poverty in general predict poor outcomes. So as a public health perspective, we need to look at poverty in our society as a whole and understand the association between addressing systematic issues with poverty and mental illness talked about this a little bit already about the stigma. The good news is that it is decreasing. And the bad news, though, is these systems of care designed a long time ago don't have the capacity. And this is a big problem also, and is competition versus collaboration. So getting all the different mental health professionals to work together can be very challenging. Um, so the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the social workers, the nurse practitioners, and especially when you've got the people doing the cash businesses. I mean, there's enough mental health issues to go around for everyone. And every, if we could get a little bit higher level of respect among all the mental health clinicians, everyone working together as a team, it gets us much better outcomes. And I go, we all, I go by Tom, we all go by first name basis at our clinics. We're all part of the teams with the parents and there, but it, there's a lot of work to do between creating a true collaborative environment in mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. I, I could go ahead and do this, but here's some of the psychiatrist jokes. <laughs> um, so, so Baca, so in San Jose, actually opened in Cupertino in 2007, um, and then we're on our fourth clinic now that we expanded to, and now we're in West San Jose, and we have an outpatient clinic and an intensive outpatient program. And what we started our intensive outpatient programs in 2013, and this was, because there's no hospitals in Santa Clara County. The hospitals that do exist don't provide good care. And so from an outpatient level, 
we needed some higher level of care for kids that needed more intensive services. So the one thing we could do without too much trouble was start these intensive outpatient programs. So this is what we've done in both San Jose and in Oakland. We're hoping to go to San Mateo County next. Um, and we're taking a little different strategy. We just met with the leadership of San Mateo County. That, and Vic, I don't know if you know these guys, but they were a breath of fresh air. They seem to really care about their community. They've already said, just give us your address, we'll sign you up. And I was like in disbelief at, at that meeting. But so we're probably going to go into San Mateo County next. But really, our mission is to get multiple clinics all throughout the Bay Area. Seven different people who control the mental health in the county sat down with us from the medical director to the, I don't even, I can't even recall all the names, but everyone who had anything to do with program development and allocation of their resources for mental health treatment, they were in the room and they, um, yeah, they were excited to have us to come and they guaranteed us that as soon as we have our address of our building, they'll be signing us up and allowing us to provide full services, um, which was, I, I had heard that about San Mateo County, but I didn't really believe it would be true. So I'm very optimistic about, about that. So when you there. say signing up, you mean you'll be getting, Medi you'll be able to get Medi-Cal? Just a very, just, just like that, huh? Just like that. And it, it's really, it, that's how it should be. A, you know, yeah. an agency comes in and wants to help it shouldn't be that complex. There's there's a lot of patients to go around. And yeah, so I yeah. We're, we're very excited about that. So we're we're unique in that we try to do we'll send our people to the school to work with the school and get the right plan in place. We'll send our therapists and, and physicians to people's homes to go get a piece of the home environment. We'll treat people in our outpatient clinic and in our intensive outpatient program. So we don't have the full con continuity of care because we're missing some of the more, the partial hospital programs and our own hospital. Hopefully we're, we're making some strides in that area. Um, but we're trying to provide as much, we provide the most comprehensive mental health treatment of any clinic in the area. Um, we, we treat the entire family system, so anyone Kids, we're, you know, we're trying to go more by VACA, but kids are age 26 and under, um, and, but then we treat the parents also, so you have to treat the whole uh, family unit we talked about. And we take pride, we've presented research on the kids that come to our clinics, we get off medication more often than they go on medication, and we presented that research, which shows that if you provide comprehensive care, you can don't need to use medication. Yeah, what about stable? We do, and we give we give priority to family members of kids we already have in treatment. Okay. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you see a difference between male and female children in terms of treatment and um, care? You know, as far as what they're coming in for treatment for, or results when looking at both treatment. Uh, let's see, we have a pretty even split of male to female patients. Um, yeah, it's hard, it, it, which I see is that, like, just myself. What's your experience been? Well, I have a child, a girl. Like. Um, but a lot of the 
actual illnesses are present in pretty equal numbers in both, in all kids. But it is, there are differences in how they present. The treatment strategies are the same, whether male or female, but yeah, but definitely every individual and every family we treat has, has differences that are, are unique. In combination of, you are treating a group of the, the kids or families, they are penalized as high risk. Therefore, they don't have medical diagnosis yet, right? They have high risk behavior or they have a behavior toward the faculty. Is that part of the people you are treating in the family? You know, most of the people that come into our clinic are more depression, anxiety, and we have you know, autism spectrum disorders are mm-hmm. really in this area. Huge strategies. The the psychosis piece. Mm -hmm. We have some psychosis. We can't do the full best gold standard treatment for psychosis, which is full community family involvement. Mm -hmm. The good news is there are some other resources available that we can connect people with for that full family treatment, and especially ages 16 to 24, there are specific programs that give extra resources that we try to get people.
do when we have good, solid family support sure. and we yeah. don't need to do a lot of week of in-home visits, sure. then we will. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's not too many of the cases that we get. But right, right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, here, here's, so here's Baca's history. 2007 was just me. unlimited demand issue from from a business uh, and a business is not my strength but from a supply and demand standpoint you know the demand makes sense that that we should be successful since we started here's more recent data we started we have a, you can submit an email request for services now through our web page so in 2014 we had 316 requests for services um, 2015, we had 626. This is just through the online. This isn't all the phone calls that we filled each week or other referrals. This year, just through last through Monday, we already beat the number of families calling requesting services. So even though we're trying to add staff, there's I think there's 220 families on our wait list to get into the San Jose Clinic right now. And it's, it's heartbreaking and awful. And, and our, our administrative assistants who answer the phone are, are essentially being therapists on the phone and empathizing with the families about trying to get in, telling people to contact NAMI, contact Parents Helping Parents, call, write the governor. We, we try to get people, if you're frustrated and angry with the mental health care system and that, we're the only place that even takes your insurance and that for better or for worse, it's gonna be a long time before you can get in. We try to give people the advocacy route to, to help direct their efforts. Um, but this is a crisis situation. The opposite. So we, talk, we try to be fun and creative and Kathy mentioned um, headspace. Mm -hmm. you know, our clinics are not sterile doctor's offices. That's not how you treat mental health issues. So um, we're fun and we're friendly. Um, we try <laughs> to use technology. So do people know Minecraft? <laughs> yeah. You know, we created a social skills group where we put kids at a computer at Minecraft and we teach them to play together well and we work with the parents and we are, have presented that research and we have we everything we do, we've manualized so that someone else could take it and replicate it. And, and lots of things that don't have the science behind them yet, we try to logically put together programs and make manuals and then track them and track our outcomes and present it. Um, so we are intensive outpatient program. There's zero evidence. There's not a single study that shows intensive outpatient programs actually do anything good. And so, you know, this is bad because then insurance companies at less than say there's no evidence that you're, any of these programs do any good, so we're not gonna pay for anything. So what we've done is we've vandalized everything, we collect our own outcomes and we're presenting it. So this is, we have to take these strategies with these different companies to show our success rate. Um, we have a, a, young, a specific young adult IOP for ages 18 to 26, and then this is gonna be the strategy with the state and other systems is that we're starting to go online. So for the past four years, I've been writing with a team some new software to bring technology and mental health treatment and outcomes data together. So this software will allow better care. It will allow immediately seeing what works. And this is what the policymakers and the people, everyone is begging for outcomes data and evidence-based treatment and also realize that the computer systems the state uses are terrible and antiquated. So this is the new strategy to use technology to improve care, make it better for <laughs> clinicians and patients, and hopefully get policymakers to change what's happening. Um, me down. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we face a lot of challenges. We keep, keep smiling about it. So, you know, funding, 
interesting. Going nonprofit, I don't know if going back in time I would go nonprofit again because you get, uh, we, we make sure that we try to run our clinic model to stay in the black so that we're not required, we don't require grants or donations to survive because that would be tragic in, in 2009, 2010 when things dried up if all our clinics closed. So we try to do this service model. But you know, we couldn't really get a line, no one will give nonprofits lines of credit until they're established. We slowly worked to get a decent line of credit established. And then in 2015, we didn't have a great year and we actually ran in the red a little bit. And so the bank immediately took away our line of credit. Just like when you're doing well and don't need it, sure, here's some money and then you have to, because we're trying to keep expanding and it costs money to expand and hire new people. And so this is a, a, a maddening issue. Staffing, we've actually done pretty good at this. I'm proud to say that we have, we'll have 13 child psychiatrists working in San Jose and Oakland. And given our nation shortage, um, our child psychiatrists, we're able to recruit them because you're part of a team. You don't sit in a room writing prescriptions and people want to come work for us but we do pay less than they could make working for Kaiser or doing a private practice. So it is, especially in the Bay Area here where the cost of living is outrageous, it is, it is a, a challenge to get people to staff. There's a lot of bad practices that happen out in the community and in other settings and we have to work to correct these bad practices um, that are happening, especially for our kids. And then you guys saw our demand issues uh, that we face. Just to bring home the statistics on funding for mental health. So here's NAMI in 2011, got $8 million from contributions and grants. St. Jude's was just one hosp of the hospitals for pediatric cancer, received $475 million in 2011. Uh, and you know, the NAMI money is for kids and adult programs. This is just for the kids. Uh, different advice, advice for parents, and this is sort of for all um, consumers of mental health, is ask questions about best scientific medicine, best scientific treatments, challenge insurance companies. Parents get, when we have insurance companies trying to deny we don't get very far if we call and try to advocate, but if, if we can help the parents call and threaten to contact the state insurance board and write us other letters, that's what gets the insurance companies to <laughs> take care of their patients. Um, pushing on the advocacy piece. And then bullying and victimization was my, it was and still is my research area. And so this is, a, a again, another topic, but you know, there's better workplace protections for adults than there are for kids in schools who are being bullied. So it's another passion about making sure we work with the schools properly. We talked a little bit about we're going to use technology, get the full continuum of services. We've already presented some data that if you provide good care, you save money. It is cost effective. If we're being cynical and money controls everything, if we can show that th with this type of care, we're going to save money. That's how we can get the health systems and policymakers to also get on board. So that's the strategy we're taking. Um, and I figure 2019 will be all set. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thanks. Please feel free to email or call me with any questions anytime. <laughs>
pace setters, you know, is, is there is there a way to romance those large companies into believing that the workforce can be improved and money can be saved by these these kinds of higher tech 